One of our greatest gifts as humans is problem solving, using our minds instead of our bodies. The faculty of good planning allows us to rise out of the darkness of violence and ignorance and ascend into a throne of enlightened pacifism. For an unusually difficult challenge, I decided to play RimWorld as a group of tribal pacifists who abhor and shun violence, harming any other living being. No weapons, no instigating of bloodshed, and no meat in our diet because we're vegans. In a planet torn by war and raiding, is it possible to establish a thriving colony under these harsh parameters? I selected five tribal colonists and embarked on my journey. On the first day, I set out my plans. The ultimate goals? One, cultivate a vegan food source in a world where meat is not an option, but an abhorrent transgression against nature. Two, engineer a well-oiled machine of a colony where my colonists can thrive and do their best work. And three, Secure our base from any threat in the most non-violent way possible that deters attackers or subdues them so that we can reform them and release them back to their people. On the first day, we spawned into a fertile valley, lowly and impoverished without a single possession. We were mere guests at the table of Mother Nature. Many forms of ownership are wrong and bad, but everything we held was shared in communion for the sake of common prosperity. The valley was all we needed to defend ourselves. Washing Beard, Sitara, Asana, Babar, and Ichabod. Our faithful Pooch, Wise Guy. Our beloved Elk, Petulia. And who could forget Amos, the monkey. In Rimworld, nowhere is safe. So our only defenses were a set of blunt traps designed not to draw their victims' blood, but rather restrain them. Time was ticking, and if you've ever lived like a vegan for a few days, you know you get hungry really fast. The first operation was planting. We'd need to cultivate a vegan diet to sustain ourselves and even thrive. The fertilest of fields were placed beside a stockpile room that would ultimately evolve into our refrigerator later on. It was deemed that this was the most efficient layout. A temporary stockpile would have to wait just to be walled later on. And though wood wasn't necessarily the most desirable material, it was all that we had at the moment. Meter by meter, we built up a solid foundation. By nightfall, we finished planting our crops, and we turned in to sleep in that makeshift shelter for the night. Day two. Having landed with no food stockpiled, gathering berries was our only option, for we did not wish to intentionally harm any of the local animals, no matter how small. We cleared out the home and stockpiled wood and berries whatever we could use to get ourselves started. And though weak with hunger, it was a better alternative than drawing blood and doing harm. Even if we suffered massive food poisoning in the process. And suffer massive food poisoning in the process, we did indeed. To combat it, we built a kitchen on the side as an offshoot of our would-be refrigerator. But time flies when you're vegan, and so does vomit. I was thankful when we reached day three. At dawn, I began penciling out what would become our future colony. No challenge is impossible. And with the right architectural layout, any colony can work. Since we depended entirely upon plant-based food sources, we would need to be well-planned. The S stands for stockpile and the W for workshop. All of these were planned rooms. We could begin cutting stone blocks upon which to lay the foundation for the rest of the base. But first we needed to research this essential technology. Yeah, Yes, a single cold snap or failing to properly preserve our foods could signal death. The colony would not be beautiful, but functional at first, with the inputs meeting the outputs, minimizing the walking distances, and ultimately making possible that essential feature, security. How would pacifists defend themselves? With the food piles shrinking, it all came back to that great gift we have as humans, problem solving. So in communion, we began tidying our food sources until that first threat, a maddened gazelle, emerging from the underbrush. Not wishing to do harm, but only preserve our own safety, we ensnared the gazelle instead of killing it in a blunt trap designed to subdue the beast without drawing its blood. Due to the unfortunate laws of motion and forces, the gazelle's front right leg was completely destroyed by the trap. And though the beast perished, its final moments were marred by transgressions of violence. We washed our hands and laid it to rest, having performed the smallest possible necessary intervention in order to preserve our colony from destruction. How would we fare with humans? Speak of the devil. When dawn rose on the sixth day, a woman named Purple assaulted us. Fortunately, we had prepared liberally for this occasion. She was ensnared, but huzzah, non-lethally. Though shoddy in its construction, we prepared a cell in which we would nurse her back to full health and release her home to her people. Unfortunately, her entire right leg was just destroyed by the trap. But at least she was alive, having intended to kill us. And while she healed, we researched new technologies. We had drawn too much blood from our aggressors, with the intention only that our enemies learn from their mistakes and be forgiven, released back to their own people alive and well, could we, through technology, require less forceful measures to defend ourselves? 
Thus, any resources that would have been spent on weapons or armaments were instead utilized to research and develop our colony into an economic powerhouse. We took upon ourselves roles that would enhance our natural proclivities. Asana the planter became the root holder, Babar, brain of the operation, became our leader and speech giver, and Sitara, clan mother, took the role of the bringer of love. Sketches materialized into blueprints, and our base was constructed despite the treachery of raiders. You see, if the economy is strong enough, no one can even come near enough to touch you, I'm afraid. And although a few perished to our blunt traps, they brought it upon themselves. The rest of the time they were maimed, or hopefully, merely just bruised. Some of them lost a finger or her toe, but it was all worth it for their reform. We continued building these traps, and recaptured the guilty sinners. Once they were healed and bandaged, they could be released back to their people. Kill them with kindness, they say. Especially if you literally kill them with kindness. But over time, I was confident that neighbors would grow to learn of our charity, and perhaps even decide to become friends instead of enemies. Over time, I began to welcome the occasional raid. You see, when a neighboring enemy sent over a raid, they expected their warriors to die, so they weren't angered by the loss of one or two souls. But I rejoiced at every assailant who was non-lethally snared by our traps, since it offered us an opportunity to bump our relations with that enemy clan and establish trust. Once we released 10 or 12 captives, they would learn of our intent to inflict no harm upon them and stop sending raids. In turn, this gave us even more time to focus on improving and growing our GDP, and ultimately, our export of psychedelic drugs, as well as corn and rice. We were the metaphorical sigma males of that planet, too focused on our grind to bat an eye toward conflict that was below us. And we forgot everything except fine dining and breathing. On day 23, a Gorenlin tree sprouted in our midst, a sure sign that nature itself was conspiring to reward us for our radical pacifist ideology. We pruned and planted it, and then continued farming raiders, nursing them back up to full health and releasing them. Normally, recruiting a prisoner requires taking great pains to break a person's will. But this time, through our charity and goodwill, we were able to start breaking down those walls of hostility instead. Wounds, though often major, drew no blood from our well-designed traps. Therefore, as long as our fallen aggressors survived the initial mauling, there were absolutely no complications of injuries or infections, and the turnaround rate was 100%, as long as they were tough enough to withstand the bruising of their bones. But what goes around comes around, and karma has a nasty way of paying back those who would seek to do harm unto others. So we padded our defenses and prayed for our enemies. With every released prisoners, our diplomacy score grew by another 12 points. Get this number up from negative to positive, or at least zero, and the other factions would learn to stop sending raids our way. In the meantime, this paved way for other fun activities, like tree hugging. So as the hordes of the unwashed masses poured like water on our walls, desiring conflict, I reflected back on my goals. I had already accomplished my first one by cultivating a vegan food source, and if I'm the judge, I would say that the base was a well-oiled machine. Now on to the third goal. Where else could threats arise? Certainly we had secured the forward wall that it should never be breached by normal means. But what about the farther flung threats that are all too common to name? Normally, I would have armed my colonists, but instead I leaned harder into that niche that made us such an economic powerhouse. You see, we were essentially the good version of communism. I control everyone, and they all do what they're supposed to. As a result, we enjoy the rewards and benefits of common prosperity. So be it. Our society was a grand experiment, complemented by the dryads that rose up out of nature, desiring that they should help us in carrying out our righteous, peaceful crusade toward a safe, efficient utopia. Suddenly, when drop pods arrived, I realized that there were still many flaws and threats I had yet to address. I paused in extreme panic. How fast could we run? Not very fast, but fast enough. They set fire to our beds, but our bedrooms were fireproofed. The raiders were unable to inflict additional suffering upon us since we had already relinquished so much of the material comforts and pleasures of meat and guns in order to progress our society toward this apex of civilization. You can't take anything away from an ascetic, and you can't take meat away from a vegan. Though you may shoot off my fingers, I didn't even need them. Again, the ultimate Sigma male flex. We were too focused on our grind to need our fingers. The intrinsic value of our work was reward enough. Our enemies, though puzzled, bathed in our tears for their fallen comrades, and they began to appreciate the beauty of life. Again, they were all released, with a 100% success rate, as long as they survived. One more big raid and they would become neutral with our faction. The plan was working, 
And so I took the time and extra resources to build up an elaborate peace symbol that grew heel root, smoke leaf, and psychoid. We spent the rest of our time constructing beautiful art. Even when mechanoids attacked, we had already finished fortifying every square foot of our own base in case of the off chance that evil robots might rain out of the sky to end our operation. These are just the sacrifices it takes to live in a peaceful society. And then we set forth the date for the Jubilee of Nonviolence, most esteemed of pacifist rituals. As it turns out, this is just a, a dance party. Oh yeah. Back to work. It was a boring Jubilee. And nothing is more exciting than working. After all, all forms of entertainment and enjoyment are a lie, propagated by the media. Instead, we focused on shamanist activities, and appealed to traditional family values, and creativity. Anyone who disagreed could step on a fat spike trap. I mean blunt trap. In time, they would learn. After all, we were right. Or were we? What is a life of conviction? And what is the good life? Well, enough of that. After some time, a woman named Ingrid wanted to join us. A 79-year-old asexual forester. The perfect match. It wasn't long before we were releasing the last of the hostile faction members, and we had grown to neutrality with everyone. You see, having relinquished violence, aggression, and dominance, we had done something known by almost no human civilization since the Greeks and Romans. We had surpassed any expectations. While the normies in the Dark Age shot each other with crude weapons, buzzed by their intake of smoke leaf, we became the market makers and the suppliers of smoke leaf. Essentially, we were Singapore. Copy all of the overpowered capitalist strategies on a societal level so that our economy would flourish, but continue to live as ascetics in common prosperity. We were living the good life. Don't question all of the corpses in the entryway. They brought it upon themselves. For it was our foes who walked into the inanimate objects, bringing the harm upon themselves. At long last, the kinship of Irarar attacked. We had finally achieved perfect peace. Hostility turned to neutrality, and all it cost was the entire forest. Every tree just lay there dead in ruins. But that's the cost it takes, and not all are willing to pay that in order to achieve peace and security. What would you be willing to sacrifice for world peace? We began to ascend into another evolution of civilization. Utopia within our grasp. We had finally allied with all of the major factions, and we were untouchable. We did so by just sending everyone all of our silver. After all, of what use is money when you have friends? It meant that anyone unwilling to negotiate an alliance would be done in by our tougher allies, or would phase plant directly into the walls of the three wide blunt traps that were now placed around every square inch of land. Of what use is the natural landscape when you finally have security? Life is existential torture. You need to be willing to experience the maximum physical pain if you want to keep peace. We entered the age of Aquarius. Just when victory was within grasp, they say pride is the road to self-ruin. And after the Tower of Babel, history has naturally been the downfall of mankind ever since. Even the greatest tree, uprooted, will never grow again. And like young arrogant gods, one by one, washing beard, Sitara, Asana, Babar, and Ichabod ate their last supper. Some call it original sin. I call it an unfortunate mod that causes you to die for meeting without a table. Whatever the cause, the mighty now look upon their works and despair at the hubris of man and all his lofty hopes and expectations. We build castles in the sky, and they float only by our ambitions. But hope remains, and we keep reaching out toward that bright future of peace. Can we leap where our ancestors failed? As always, I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. Bless my patrons, with whom I eat at the table every day in a shamanist communion feast. Thanks for watching. Until we meet again next time.